Looks like that. Uh, you have no idea how bad it is actually. Like it's. All right, so now we are live, I believe, unless I did not press the right buttons. Um, well, I'm not showing up on YouTube yet, but there's always a delay. So today is the day where we walk our backlog one more time because we haven't done this exercise in quite a while. Um, the room is fairly empty because everybody else apparently has uh, more important stuff to do than talking with me and the community about API requests, which means we get to make decisions um, in somewhat randomly uh, fashion. So I think first we want to look at the PBSD one, which we already discussed to death, I think, on email. Um, there was some discussion about whether we should add BSD instead of FreeBSD, but Apparently, um, that was a bad idea considering the status of BSD compared to FreeBSD. So, one of the purposes of FreeBSD is the thing that you should refer to. Um, I think the only discussion we had was the casing, but quite frankly, for brand names, it doesn't seem like there is a, any way to do it in a sensible fashion. So, <laughs> might as well just keep it as it is. Um, and I think pretty much everything we discussed here. Okay. So, I. Um, Let's just approve this guy. Um, API. Do, 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 do. Let's hurry up before Christoph shows up. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to discuss the case thing. All right. Bit manipulation functions. Yeah, so basically, everybody needs to be able to manipulate bits. Uh, we're exposing hardware intrinsics, which will allow um, architecture-specific bit manipulation operations, but we'd like to also expose a general purpose class that <coughs> provides the general uh, implementation as well as the software fallback for anybody to use. Um, this covers things like uh, leading zero count, um, count trailing, uh, count significant bits, um, etc. And um, I tried to help keep the initial proposal small. Um, the community, some members of the community wanted to keep adding more stuff, and I asked them to move that to a separate proposal. Okay. So it's not intrinsic, it's just yeah. utility functions that Correct. are useful so you don't have to do some crazy stuff yourself. Right. And is it that these <coughs> might just be backed by the intrinsics? And this is the. Right. On certain platforms, uh, such as x86, we will use the hardware intrinsics as a performance optimization where possible. Um, but on other platforms where either the intrinsics don't mm -hmm. exist yet or they've not been implemented, we'll have a software fallback. And uh, there was a question about the names. Um, there were several that came up. Uh, the community member that put up the proposal ended up using BitOps. One of the other ones was Bit Operations, uh, so we don't shorten ops. Um, I suggested we could just resolve that uh, here. Yeah, I mean, the other question is which NASA should this go into? Right. Like, this is not the kind of stuff that I think has to live in the system because it's not really something that we want everybody to use. Um, and the system is already is fairly clouded, so I think it should go into some numerics. Other, yeah, yeah, numerics seems fair, for example. Probably. Um, You're playing with numbers after all. Um, I think in general we say don't use abbreviations. Yeah. So that would be operation. I assume everything on this class is counting bits from the right? Yeah. So bit zero is the least significant bit. Bit one is yeah. the, uh, the number that I will call two. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, and on the pseudocode here for like complement, uh, there's no. Uh, range check that your 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 bit doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, right, um, just like with the C sharp compiler for um, when you're doing like bit shifting, uh, the 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 right hand uh, side of the operation is going to be masked to the range of the bit value. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is a proposal where I think I want to see more tempo code for because it's basically a bunch of functionality and like I'm, mm -hmm. it's not that it's bad or anything, it's just the, the question is, does this have to live in the core base, right? Or could this right. be? We use a number of these functions in CoreLib itself. 
Uh, when you say a number, like four or five of them, all um, of them? Both us and people like Roslyn use, uh, at the very least, um, leading zeros, leading ones, trailing zeros, trailing ones, pop count, rotate left, rotate right, um, complement clear, and set. Yeah, I think things that we know we will be using ourselves, I think, is one thing. But then, like, otherwise, it comes this graphic of things that we keep revving for eternity, right? And mm -hmm. if the thing lives in Colib, then, you know, that's always the most expensive part to touch. Right. And then, <clears throat> where you suggested other things be split off, would that go into a different right. class? So, so, some of the other ones that people wanted were things like that operated over a span rather than a primitive. And I don't think that those belong in Colib. Well, but so then it's like what it's the the what would the right. proposal for such a class be? Right. Uh, what's the number three two two six nine? Um. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those API examples where I'm, I'm undecided. It's like, I, I think this is the kind of stuff that we want to wrap it probably with the community in a very fast way to get to a sensible state. And I think starting this summer as a pre-release media package that we can just play with. And then so, so later on decide how we want to ship this because I don't want to ship it as a new get package necessarily because it might be too small to warrant its yeah. own assembly, right? But it's just that I don't know. It feels very heavy-handed to have to rev them as call up to just play with you know two more yeah. functions that effectively boil down to a two liner. Well, right? I, th that's... I I think if we were to expose this, what I would end up recommending is we do similar to what we had to do with unsafe, which is that we would have a for core lib we would have an internal. Uh, version that exists in the internal namespace that just has the few functions we need for Corelib, and then everything else would have to live in CoreFX. Well, yeah, that's the other thing, like, depending on where we put it, but I think that that doesn't necessarily make it much much cheaper for the customer, right? Because it's just to update the entire platform to get to three, you know, three, more, three more members, right? Like, well, well, no, so like with Unsafe, the, the internal namespace is only used by Corelib. No, I get it, but whether you are in CoreFX or in MS Corelib itself doesn't matter much because the, the rest of CoreFX is still part of the platform. You don't get mm -hmm. to update it independently of the rest, right? So, like, as far as the acquisition goes, it's still, you know, it's 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 layered differently. Um, yeah, like it's basically just a, a bunch of bit massaging and on our, on, on our end in terms of getting people to use it. Um, then the other question is like, what's the scenario for those APIs? Is it just that we found them to be useful, or is there actually like somebody who's building something bigger with that they're, that will be useful to look into? They're really performance-oriented APIs that are used for all kinds of algorithms. I think that was another question. Like, do we have like some sort of like I don't know high-level algorithms coming that we can use as a litmus test whether these are complete usable? I don't think we currently have any proposals to add algorithms. Yeah. So the suggestion sounds like maybe we should do something in CoreFX Lab first. Yeah, I think in general when you introduce an API area like this, you, you, you kind of want to search for upstream consumers of that API, because mm -hmm. otherwise it's like, what's the what's the bar for success, right? If it's just, I'm done with churning it, or do I yeah. do I have a customer who says, yep, I'm, 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 I'm happy with that. And otherwise you, you run this risk of like shipping something that is useful for like two people that happen to care, but mm -hmm. nobody else, and that's, so might not be the right trade-off. Marvin uses rotate left. And it just has its own implementation. Uh, right, and it's using the JIT recognized pattern to uh, emit the ROL instruction. And is there anything special about these things that only we can do? No, right? They're all like pretty straightforward. I mean, right, the, as straightforward as bit twiddling gets, but like. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's about as straightforward as bit twiddling get, but most other standard libraries provide some, some of these functions, or the compilers provide built in intrinsics. 
that aren't necessarily platform specific intrinsics that provide this functionality. Yeah, I mean, we talked about compiler intrinsics, right? So, for example, I think you brought it up with like overflow, right? Is there any, is there, would there be any benefit to have them compiler intrinsics to actually do things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to? Uh, so that's what the hardware intrinsics are on our end. No, I meant like like as in C sharp intrinsics. I don't right? think I don't think C sharp would add intrinsics for this kind of stuff. It's not representable in IL. Uh, Other than being no, what you would do is you would literally like burn them into something like this, right? And then you would be able to honor like I don't know overflow or other things to actually emit code differently, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think overflow is useful for any of these because it's basically. The, the only thing that the C Sharp compiler has for operation semantics is checked and unchecked, and none of these impact checked or unchecked. Yeah, because checked and unchecked are just different instructions for, like, you know, add yeah. or. I don't think. Are there even ones for bitfit? I don't think there is. Right? Like, no, it, it's, it's like, basically yeah. like if, you, if you're if you doing some operation and you end up overflowing or underflowing, then throw an exception. Don't we have a checked left? Like, there was like some shifting, right? Where we checked it or something, wasn't there? It was like a rotating one, and then there was one that's I'm not sure. Either. But at least for all of these, none of them have um, overflow semantics, because even rotate, it's by definition wrapping around. Yeah, in which case, yeah, whatever. All right. Because otherwise, like, the problem is that you can just literally copy and paste the code into your program, and it might actually be better, depending on... You know, whether you want to tweak the algorithm slightly to do something slightly differently, or mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Again, like I think there's nothing wrong with it per se, but I also think like I would like to see a bit more upstream consumerization of it. Okay, I that, can that pull together a list of all the would places motivate that the we're using it today and stuff as well. Yeah, because otherwise we end up with like adding random utility functions to our platform, right? And mm -hmm. then kind of it's borderline in that territory. Um, all right, then let me just filter down to things that are in 3.0 first, uh, which is, I guess, milestones. And then within that, actually, before I do that, because maybe I fucked it up and I said it, let me search for the these guys here. Yeah. Unfortunately, both of these things are things where Christoph should be here, because he owns that area. <coughs> Um, so we might as well just skip that one, and then just look at everything else we have in the mod. So, um, do we want to sort by oldest? Yeah, that's probably not a good idea. Uh, I mean, what we want to do is sort by easiest, but uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't know that. Yeah, yeah, it's just that oldest seems to be fairest usually, because otherwise you just end up. Reviewing things, you know, the lower API. I don't think we <laughs> we get to decide here, but um, yeah, and a few of these look like things that we've either pushed out or that need people here. Yes, into the one, this one. Uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> uh, 
table is also something else. So I'm the API should be easy. Yeah, which is to use the word unsafe not to mean dangerous, but to mean doesn't capture async local. Yeah, which I think we have done in other places. So I think that's consistent with our definition of it is consistent with yeah. our inconsistency, yes. Unsafe and very overloaded. Unsafe means think hard about calling this. We hope that you understand what the context means. Yeah, unsafe is the Pullman's version of not having requiring the unsafe keyword. So yeah. Yeah. Been on YouTube commenting? Not on YouTube yet? But no, nobody's commenting yet. Um, so the only question that I have is what does Pima look like today? And we have so many Pimas, but I think it's plenty of. I don't know. Yeah, no, so it's plenty of time. Of course. Yeah, we've got like three times. Oh, uh, system threading timer. Jesus Christ. No more chances. Here we go. Yeah, the static method is a bit unfortunate, but I guess that is also not entirely bad because I think the most statics today is sort of kind of helps with making the API slightly less discoverable. Which is probably all up the win. And then the arguments would be Callback object in int or time span. So go time span, time span. Then you and two time period. Okay. Yeah, I think this one we added because the other ones were horrible. Uh, callback state. <coughs> I think it's reasonable. Yep. <coughs> Yeah, we should look at that issue. That is a fairly more complicated API than the other one. Yeah, that was. Well. All right. Well, maybe we should un approve the other one and. Uh, I was about to say that. Wait for wait for Steve. I think that's something that Steve should discuss in person. I mean.
All right. So that's the alternate is need to work as well. Good. I like when they have caches with them as well. Um, da -da -da. Hey, Kusa, how's it going? Hi, guys. You're looking for the what other is number? It? Is it just three hours today? Yeah, they just walked through this. Is that not the one? Uh, two, six, five, two, three. I think. Oh, here we go. Yep. One. Uh, you want to jump back to your net standard one about it yet, Crystal? Too far. Um, so, as part of us reviewing the Darkness Standard API editions, there were a few suggestions. One of them was memory shields on i tradable, uh, which everybody seems to agree with. Uh, where this is. Are they the same pointer and length? Well, this yeah, interface the same implementation context. cannot be different than the equals that it already mm -hmm. of, uh, overrides. Correct? Do we agree on that? Yeah, I think yeah. it's just literally just. Fair enough. Yes. Okay. So yes, it will be a. We've already defined the semantics. Super useful implementation of. Well, it is. It's the interface. Is is this the same memory as opposed to is are these the same contents, which is right. a different thing. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. I don't see a reason to not implement the interface unless, you know, a yawn yeah. with no one. Given that we also have the manually strongly typed API as well, it seems very weird not to need an interface because you literally implement the interface. We got out in half an hour. Congratulations. By, uh, um, by convention. So any, any reason not to prove it then? Cool. All right. Just as an aside, should this be like an analyzer warning or something if you implement the pattern but don't implement the interface? Yeah, we used to have FX cut, but then it was uh, <laughs> deemed to be a very important feature for uh, uh, Studio. API can hit for standard. You probably still want that yellow and they want to get rid yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, well, I guess at this point it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, it's more like for making sure we review the APR. Because yeah. it said, like, eventually you have to do it anyway. And it's a number that is on the top, so we have standard. Fair enough. All right, standard form of try parse. Um, so Marek mentioned that why well, we don't have a try parse method. So here's the API div in case you care. Isn't it any one? I I'm really confused what would try parse do here because Well we have a parse method that takes its format. Like yeah, it's saying oh, it can never fail. I see what you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I forgot that we added this parse. So okay. can it can so this can throw, correct? Yes. Yeah, so then we probably should have a try parse yeah. right. Right. So what uh, what would be the signature of try parse? Uh, well, I would suppose it turns bool and then out standard format. No, what does it take as a parameter? It's a span of char or string? Uh, I don't know. I think you probably want to have an overload that takes both, yes. So that's what I was wondering. I was honestly uh, looking at some APIs today in Azure SDK, and I kind of recommended that we only implement try parse taking span. And the thinking was the following. Uh, if you don't care about fair, you know, like, you don't think too much about it, you just call parse. Yeah. But if you do, then, you know, what's the cost of just having one, uh, having to change, you know, get uh, span from a string. 
Uh, wasn't the argument that some languages uh, like VB don't really easily support spam? Yeah, I think he's saying VB can handle the exception. No, no, no. So it's not, but I don't think the languages don't support spam. That's not what the issue was. The issue was that some languages don't support implicit cast. Yeah, that's the oh, okay. case. Is okay. you can't Got it. you can't just take a regular string and pass it in well, and have overload. You have to call us. I thought that it was that VB can't ever talk about a ref struct. Yeah, and that as well. Like VB, if it sees this is a ref struct, it says oh. you can't talk about this type at all. Yeah, I think there's two issues here. Right? Yeah, there's yeah. one that is has to do with the conversions, which is regardless of ref structs. It's just if you rely on an API design that exploits an implicit conversion, this doesn't work very well in F sharp. Yeah. So a good example here is. Uh, the entire metadata reader API surface is structs so that you basically have a class hierarchy of handles that is emulated by implicit conversions to the base handle, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, yep, you can still use the API surface in AppShop, you just have to insert the task by hand. And then there's the other issue where, well, you can't even express the value of the result of the cast because the language doesn't support ref right? <laughs> and then the question is, yeah, are we okay with saying VB can still write the code, but you have to handle the exception? And that seems somewhat heavy-handed for, we were just too lazy to add a moment. Yeah, I think... Especially because it's just be, a pass So right? I think it's, you know, um, both of these issues, I think they need to be talked in the context of who is this API for. Because yeah. I, I would be shocked if many VB developers, even many c -sharp developers, will use this type. So, so uh, like, I would agree would with that, but then, the, but, but then the question is, why do we have this method here to, at all? Yeah, like, uh, what, are you one? accepting yeah. this as no, user input? Or? Because I think this one is, this one is like mainland scenario. Yeah, but you have already an implicit conversion form string to char, to, to char. Like in C sharp, you can already pass a literal string here anyway. Yeah, I, but uh, if so. there's a language that doesn't support spans, they at least have this option. They I can would, use. I would honestly say try parse is more mainline scenario than parse is because more often than not, you have input from an external source and you don't know whether it's valid or not. So try parse is generally your default. I think when you're saying well, what is mainline scenario is what you think <laughs> you would write in your code. I would yeah. uh, challenge you to look at. Uh, like the code that developers, VB developers write. And I bet they don't use try parse. They just use parse. Well, so it's, yeah. there's a difference what we want people to use and what they actually use in practice. Um, but we're also the BCL, so we have to support all languages and frameworks. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, this API does. You can, you can handle their... I don't know. I, I think... Okay, so on, on a very high level, I think sometimes we add members and they have almost zero value. And I think this type already is for super performance efficient scenarios. This type shows up in APIs that are in separate package, right. optimized for performance. Mm -hmm. It already has parse method. Try parse is already uh, like even more optimized for performance. <laughs> we are talking about like you know, ten people in the world that will ever call it. But, but this is, but I think this goes back to your earlier comment about w what is the larger context of the APIs being used. Yeah. Don't use standard format in and of itself. Like, can you use realistically standard format if your language doesn't is not a language that can support spec? Period. Uh, the answer is probably no. No, the, the, the answer is definitely yes. Why? Like, what 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 we use this API in what, in what context? Like, where do you pass the standard format to? Oh, uh, well, you're saying all the current APIs that take standard format, they also take spam. That's true. Right, which is basically what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. standard format in and of itself is probably not useful if you can't talk spam. Yeah. So, in which case, I would say what would, what would make sense to me is not have this method, sorry, not have this method here, like kill this method here, only have this one, and then only add a try parse that also takes the only span of char would be my proposal. Like this one seems like, you know, it doesn't hurt, but also doesn't help. It doesn't, it doesn't add much. So, so this is one side of the uh, kind of, uh, of the opinion spectrum. The other one to play devil's advocate, like maybe we should just have uniform patterns. But now the uniform pattern is like, what we're gonna have eight different parsing members on every single type that can be parsed. No, that's exactly why I don't like that. Like the, like, I mean, even with, 
even with F sharps issuing implicit cast, they already said they will have hardware knowledge in the compiler about span anyway, so they will know that you can convert a span to a string. So I think like for those kind of things, you should probably just say, you know what? For for really mainline APIs like path.join, it's okay to have the overload. But for everything else, it's like okay, like either know how host spans operate, and then you can use the API, or you don't, and then you can't, and then that's fine. All right. So to summarize, what's our new parsing guidance in in light of spans and and slices and so on and so on? Basically, we divide types into super mainline scenario where we already have these methods and they should have four members and then new types that are performance optimized and they should just should have two or even one member. Like, why do we even have parse? Why not just try parse and takes a span? Because you don't have to like craft the exception yourself. It just makes it easier to use, yeah. Yeah, well. Calling this. So, I mean, that's really the only benefit, right? You I did a GitHub it. search for try parse uh, with language VB and then uh, I it you know many 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 hits in the first two pages. I've only seen one caller who checked the return value of it. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be fair, I bet you'd see a lot of C sharp code like that. <laughs> it, indeed. So it's try parse is very popular in VB. Sort of. Well, they want parse no throw <laughs> because the the name implies try parse. If you can. Yeah. Um, anyway, just. Well, searching care. GitHub for VB is already a mean exercise. Yeah, so, yeah. so, uh, so you know, definitely, if, if something is in the, you know, performance case where particularly want something as a ref struct, definitely try parse with the span. Like, if it's on a ref struct already, then uh, VB can't talk about it. So we don't need to say, oh, well, we need a way of, of getting around the. If you can't talk about a span, VB can talk about memory. But it can't talk about span. Uh, so certainly on a, on a ref struct, try parse with the read-only span of char, and you don't need the string because we'll get implicit conversion from C sharp. F sharp is adding explicit support for it, so you know that was fine. Parse again, normalizing the exception that is helpful. So parse can make sense, but if something is a path, you know it, it's. You know, something like path where it's, well, every program should want to do something with this, and we're adding the, this functionality is probably something everyone should do, then we should make sure that we have the VB uh, support, you know, as per the guidance in uh, framework design guidelines of, remember, not all languages are the same. Yeah, and we should also follow up with uh, Catherine, too, on that, I think, because I recall she was the one that was making the, the strongest argument for having those overloads. Yeah, I think the other thing that, we, that VB is looking into is like having some sort of simplistic version of span support where you basically are able to produce a value on the same stack frame and pass it to another method on the same stack frame, but you can't really store it in the field period regardless of what your type is, which is like a very simplistic implementation of it. And then these things would actually work because you just produce the value from the string instance, you immediately pass it away, and then uh, it's basically transparent for the caller. But we do, uh, at least FDG points out the other CLI languages, so Python.net, Ruby.net, et cetera, and they probably can't talk about ref structs. So. Well, I think anything that is dynamic in nature by definition is screwed, cool, right? Well, so, I mean, the, the, it's the. <clears throat> When when do we count on you being able to use span yeah. versus when do we say that we need the the an array or string overload and also dynamic languages are not screwed they just you just get an error or something well or you just compile it <laughs> or if it's you know if anybody's done uh, JavaScript.net then it just makes up a new behavior at <laughs> Uh, you just make the case for jscript.net again? <laughs> no, I was making the case against. <laughs> good, good. Just make um, sure. Yeah, so I, I don't know how we codify mainline versus niche, but uh, well, the I mean, easiest rule is we just always do both. So the thing is that it's not only both. So we should think about this guidance uh, more carefully because, for example, we haven't even started to talk about parsing of UTF-8 payloads. Like, we also have this thing now. So, like, I don't know. 
the kind of the point we need guidance because we're gonna end up with basically every single type having to have so many different part methods. Well, it, it, you have the methods, but the implementation for the former is generally no more complicated than calling the latter with an as span ourselves. So it's like we have the additional API, but there's no additional complexity in implementing or maintaining it. Yeah, but we care much less about complexity of implementing and maintaining than about experience for the users who now are confused which out of these eight APIs. Yeah, the problem with rules like this, where you basically rely on the fact that everybody does it the right way all the time, is just not sustainable. So you'd say whether we care or not, like what will happen in the ecosystem is you invariably end up with this mixed situation. So the fewer things you require people to do, the more likely you are that things are semi-consistent at some point. So maybe to be cons kind of concerned about this, we can always add APIs later. I propose that we just add the parts that just takes uh, the span for now. That's right. Because we don't even have try. So I, I don't fully even understand. Yes, we should add try. Well, so you're, you're wanting to restrict the net standard edition. Because I believe both of these shipped in net core already. Yes. Are we talking about inclusion to net standard or are we talking about, uh, We're talking about next version this. of net core? Yes. Well, both. both. It means so I would require. add try parts to net core, but for now we With have just no choice, span. just add the span one, uh, I mean just the parse one to net standard, correct? <coughs> Can we? I mean, theoretically we could no, no, sub. No, no. Can, we, can we add the net standard that you, we are working on? Can it have APIs that we don't yet have in the platform? Yes, that's oh. the whole point. Okay, so because we, we add them to the platform. Net, because we net Core two one, so we can expose them. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah Net then Core two one will not implement Net Standard okay. two one. Then I would net say we should will. have parse and try parse that takes span on this side. So let me get this straight. So you're so you're still suggesting removing parse that takes a string in Net Standard? Yeah. Even I'm not, I don't feel strongly this is the reason why I would remove it. Because then the next question is why don't you have tripars that takes a string? And then in the future, why don't you have tripars that takes UTFA uh, string? And then we end up with no. six or eight members. But UTFA string can't go to read only span of char, right? Not char. Exactly. So then we would have not only UTFA string, we would have UTFA string and span of char eight and like. Yeah. Okay, let me, okay, let me rephrase. So what I currently wrote up is. Standard format parse string should be removed because uh, this type cannot be realistically used for languages that don't support span of T, so relying on implicit conversion seems fine. However, we already shipped this API, so we can't actually remove it. So the, the best we can do is not exposing the API from the standard, which yeah, I mean, we could, it just seems very heavy handed. It, it is .NET Core 3.0, major version, breaking changes are permitted. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> this for it, I, I, I was just suggesting not to include it in that standard. But I don't care strongly about it because I don't know whether it's massive value. So the only reason why I don't like subsetting the standard is because this API will show up every single time I do a diff now. And like now we have to remember this for eternity that we never add it back. And that's honestly not, not a tractable problem. That's why I would rather say fuck it, like too bad. We ship the API. We we wouldn't we wouldn't add other overloads in the, in the future, so we would say we would only add read only span of byte and not add UTF8 string and then well that's you know, we yeah, have learned. Kind of okay. In this case I'm okay with it. <clears throat> Jeez, we just shipped this type already legacy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean we make mistakes. I mean Unless we go with gems. Okay. I mean, the, the easiest stand or the easiest rule is always, right? I, don't, I guess the other easiest rule is never. No, I meant uh, you but with we your proposal to remove the API. Yes. Oh, that one. Yeah, fine. Whatever. <laughs> I, I would be happy to see us make a break. And also, to be completely clear, this type can be used without spam. Well, I'm saying realistically, right? what do you do with this format? Yeah. I mean, no. So you can you can add an API, like formatting API. Sure. That takes this instead of formatting. Sure, I can I can use OS platform without using runtime information. It's just, it, yeah, it's just a contrived example, right? No, no, no it's, I don't think it's contrived. It's just today <laughs> we don't have APIs that consume this type and also don't consume spam, but they would totally make sense. 
So imagine the regular, you know, um, uh, string that format. You take this type instead of <coughs> not string format because it's a com uh, by, compound. By object, object. Yeah. yeah, two string. Yeah, two string. Yeah. Could take this type. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's no difference now. Zero allocating string that format to uh, Midori. I remember that type of thing. No, it still exists in Cortex Lab. In system text that format. I'm just saying I remember writing that okay. for Midori. Okay. <clears throat> and then being proud of the fact that I was the last check into Midori. And then there were further check ins. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what it was? That you, your, killed uh, it. you killed it. Yeah. Was that your interview exercise? Yeah. Oh, you okay, yeah, now I, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> you should write a blog post. Last Midori check. <laughs> dot, 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 until the one after it. <laughs> I think that was it. All right, so then let me just copy and paste my notes that I have written now. That works great. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. mm, we probably aren't going to name both parameters format. Probably not. <laughs> I mean, you could. I don't so think you can. Really you can. Right. No, you're right. You can. Right. <laughs> I thought you could at the IL level. What? In the out. metadata, yeah. if you encode it explicitly. Well, it has to be every, every parameter. It's a tri oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Jeez. I was still thinking about the format. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how you would write a kick ass obfuscator then. Just every method has an empty string name, every parameter is an empty string. And there we go by shooting again. Um, uh, API approved. There's a... All right. There's a quick one off an already approved one that I want to bring up. Um, okay. Which is such a void in. Um, so if we open um, pull request 26582. Pull request. I have to say, that's not... Well, if you just open an issue and change the number, it'll switch itself to a pull request. That's not the point. <laughs> I mean, we can go. I can find the the approved API. But, okay. So what's the number? Uh, two six five eight two. It says zip in it, but that's the right one. Okay. Uh, so find, there's a question from Steve. Does the you should we avoid delegate delegate invocation? Uh, no, it's uh, we, this is the first public value tuple we're adding. This one? Mm. Oh yeah. Uh, right. <clears throat> so the question is, since this is the first public value tuple we're doing, do we make, make leave these as item one, item two, or do we name them? And then if we name them, what is the casing that we name them on? AKA, we're inventing a rule retroactively now. Was, was this was this an approved value tuple API? Yep. Oh wow! Because I, well, I spoke with Steve last week, and he said that as a matter of course we didn't do it. Okay. Right. So then, Whatever. so Steve asked uh, me, Christoph, and and Emo, uh, like, what is like what is our rule on this? And I said I'm pretty sure our rule is void. And he said, well, it's already been approved. So now, what is our rule on this? Unapproved. Uh, or or name it. Yeah. Yeah. So really, we now plan we we're gonna be using value tuples for public API. Well, yeah, I, I think that the you know as as I discussed with you this morning, I think that our plan is still avoid. Uh, but in this case, it, it actually makes sense based on the what the implementation okay. does. Well, I would say there are some link APIs where you want to expose tuples. Yeah. Right. Like, for example, like okay. zip is an example. There's another one. There is a uh, what's it called? There's a select that basically returns you the index yeah. and and the value. No, totally. I once Jeremy said that like. Yeah. If our guidance is 
in general avoid, but there are cases where it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I think I like it. This, yeah. this, this I sense. don't like, let's now open the gates yeah. and like, start I using the And, and so then it's, uh, what should we name, or should we leave it as the uh, default name, or should we name the parameters? And if you scroll down a little bit, based off talking with Christoph this morning, it seems like we should name it T first, first with a capital F, comma T second, second with a capital yeah. S. That makes uh, sense. Uh, and then they look like property, it looks like a, a property-based thing. And this is simply making sure that, that this room has consensus on what Christoph and I discussed while Christoph wasn't paying attention. Yeah. So. <laughs> that, it makes sense. Uh, okay. So now we know how we would name them in the case of generic composition for uh, link. All right. That is all. Yeah, I think practically speaking, I think the... the I, most people don't do that, though. Most people do use lower cases. I mean, that's basically sample code that has tossed around for ages. And I think part of it is because the general pattern evolves into this, right? You decompose them into locals, and you basically use the names that come from from the thing usually. But arguably, there could just be a, a change to the to the ID. I think if you do var t equals uh, so for var t in names dot zip, I think you get an IDE suggestion that suggests decomposing them directly. And they can do the translation from uh, capital N to lowercase n, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. they're probably already do anyways. So yeah. I'm fine with that. Okay. Yeah, I have curiosity who gave it a thumbs up. No. What? I've never opened thumb. the thumbs up. Okay. Some, <laughs> which I think is the up. some person the, get up. I think it's the person who opened the PR. Of, okay, I'll make that change. Well, oh, there was wasn't that uh, there was Andy, right? Uh, right. Okay, so what happened? Here? We have a uh, the start of a rule. Oh, yeah, so Andy's by the way, like, what do we do with these rules now? Because they are only in our head. Right? Yes, uh, the Jeremy <laughs> is writing them. You're yeah. writing them down. <coughs> chapter ten, if I remember the Sweet. chapter. Number. Well, no, because this would be a member guidance. So, uh, so chapter five. That is cool. Didn't you at some point contact them regarding copyright issues to put the whole thing as marked on somewhere? Well, so we have, we already have an agreement with, with them. The bullets, if it starts with do, do not consider a void, it's public domain. What? <laughs> it doesn't start with that. It's... If it does start. Right. So oh. if it's basically the guideline, the, the kind of the, the, the bullet, bullet point. Yeah. So then it says public domain. Our design it's explanatory test. It, it takes <laughs> samples and everything is up. So we can literally take the whole book and only have the bullet points in a, in a GitHub repo, and that's fine. It's uh, just work to, for somebody to copy and paste all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Well, well, that's already the case. Well, we have a bunch of it. In it's MSP. already on MSD. Well, obviously, it only has a subset. It doesn't have all of it. Well, it only has the bullets. Second thing that I don't remember is it may be <coughs> only up to some chapters. Yeah, and I think it's literally just only like. I don't know. First six chapters. Well, and then even within them, I think it's only a subset. No, then it, it should be all bullets. All bullets are public domain. We also have it on docs.microsoft, which means it's already in a markdown somewhere on GitHub. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it even that says translated from, from. Even right. at, at the bottom of the pages, it says that, it says that it's public domain. Wow. Well. Having said that, some bullets without the explanatory text don't make a lot of. Well, we can just write new text. Yeah, I mean, yeah we've got a lot of explanatory text in the guidelines here. For uh, yeah, either either in our own thing we can re-derive the explanation, or in three E we can make sure that the bullet is uh, a little more descriptive. <laughs> <laughs> well, we accept PRs. So let's put it that way. Um, as long as well, so yeah, we accept people. PRs, and and we will allow merging the PR as long as. It doesn't get Kristoff in a copyright violation with himself. <laughs> well, it's not himself, but that isn't with me, but yeah. Still. Okay. Um, all right, so then let's close this one. Um, da -dun -da -dun. Now let me go over the ones that look like something Kristoff can talk about. Uh, didn't I cannot talk about any of these. Didn't we get through the async disposable stuff? Yeah, let's talk about this after this one. So let's first try to get maybe these guns either rejected or approved. 
At Stream Builder, a pen read only memory of chart to existing, a pen read only memory of chart for perp. Why would it be for perp? Can you guys hear me? Ah, oh, Steven, you're there. Hello. Yes, yeah, I My previous meeting finished. Uh, so this one is, so Eric's concern is basically you have a method that takes an object and you have an overload that takes a read-only uh, span of char. Um, and his concern is that if you pass a read-only memory of char, it'll happily go into the object overload and you won't realize that what you meant to do was called, you know, memory.span and pass that in. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think it makes sense, and in general, I would say our guidance should be if the operation on memory is bulk operation, it, it's fine to have APIs. I just didn't want to have APIs that operate on the individual keys inside memory. Well, but presumably we would say just use the span one if it didn't already have an object overload. Well, I think in this case, it's, it's less about whether we are okay with that one. It's just, it's just a less of two evils. We want to get this passed in as an object, and then somebody calling this two string on the resulting object. No, no, I said it's totally fine. That's, that's, yeah. yeah. Way worse, right? I just don't think that we I'm would always be saying add both span and memory. It's yeah. in this case we have span and object, and now memory goes in the middle. Does the implicit conversion from mutable to read only beat the object overload? Or do we need to the quad specialized? Yes. Sorry, what was that? If I have You mean do we are you asking whether we need both memory and read only memory? Yes, would memory box to object but read only memory would be direct or and then uh, I guess span can't go to object, so that's an illegal overload so it picks the read only span conversion. I'm pretty sure that base types beat implicit conversions. But it's, it's read only memory isn't the base class of yeah. Well, object, sorry, but object. Object. Yeah. So we have to add lots of overloads. So we would need memory and read-only memory. Yeah. But span, because span is not assignable to object, there's only one candidate, which is the read-only span conversion. Yeah. So so we need to add memory and read-only memory. Yeah. <coughs> Testing this out just to verify that. Yeah. Fair enough. It right. calls the read-only memory, the implicit conversion ones. Seriously? Yep. Why? I've got it on chart lab. The implicit conversion <laughs> for only memory wins over object. Mm. I think that's also to cover the case of things like you have a float overload, you pass in an int, you want it to call the float overload rather than object, if you have both. Well, Giant is right when he says that overloading rules are optimal. Yeah. So implicit conversions win. And Yeah, so the experimentation says we don't need memory of T, that it will it will appropriately specialize to the read-only memory. Yeah. So approved as is. And Bertrand Myers right when he said that languages shouldn't have overload. You could argue that they really. shouldn't have implicit conversions, but or they shouldn't have types. <laughs> no, he, he likes types. He doesn't like overloading. We shouldn't have programming languages there. They're well, all you. I mean, there's there's over there, there there there's more than one kind of overload. Type based overloading is is where we're not understanding so what's happening. Would you say that the term overload, overload is overloaded? Yes. Okay. Well, I don't even think that it's type based overloading. The issue here <laughs> is implicit conversions. If you didn't have implicit conversions, then it would all be straightforward. The compiler would either say you don't have an exact overload, you have to convert. Or it would work. Yeah, and then so every single F -sharp time it right. gets type and break. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, but default parameter type overloads, like those, don't complicate things. I mean, they do, but not as much as which thing am I going to call now? Oh, it doesn't work for extension methods. That's what it is. Like if, uh, if you have an extension method hanging off of reading right, memory because it, jar, an instance an instance member invocation. Uh, sorry, a, cap a compatible <laughs> instance member invocation beats an extension method. Well, in, in all cases. In all cases, yeah. I think even if it exists, even if it's an exact match, because extension methods yeah. were bolted onto the spec later, yeah. they came in a later version. So. Yeah. But if you have two <laughs> extension methods, then the normal rule is applied. Well, if you if the only viable candidates are extension yeah. methods, then then now you're back to standard resolution rules. Yeah. Okay. And I throw in. Alright, so let me go run into a wall. Let me go run on a treadmill. Oh. That sounds a lot more pleasant than running into a wall. 
Maybe not. Could run on a treadmill and then turn it off. <laughs> and just launch yourself. <laughs> and then launch forward, yourself into backward, the wall. Forward. Say, uh, why would you run? <clears throat> What's wrong with you people? Like, don't do that. <clears throat> okay, add a reader for the only sequence of T. I think that's the whole thing that we start to review, right? So that's a larger issue. It's our email. Steve, now that you're on the call, the timer creates static method. So there are two competing proposals. There's this one, and then there's the other yeah. one. I, I commented on them right. both. They're, they're not really competing. This is just more a superset. So the, the other one is basically just this unsafe create method. Right. Uh, and this one adds to it the optional argument at the end. <laughs> um, and then there's an additional method as well. Well, I mean, they're competing as in, like, if we would do the first, we wouldn't do the former. Uh, we wouldn't do the latter. Right? So we would, we would do one of them, but not both of them, right? Well, doing the second one is essentially doing the first, is what I'm saying. Sure. Yeah, either way. So I, I think we should do this one. So my, my, my only impression was from reading it is like the, 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 the first one I totally get. It's, you know, it's a pretty straightforward response to the. Um, yeah, like it's it, like effectively the problem here is that you, you have the uh, uh, flow context that you don't want to flow through your timer creation. So basically, the unsafe one just does basically says suppress that. It's a pretty straightforward response to that problem. The, the yeah. one that you propose is a lot more involved, and I, I don't quite understand what why that's necessary yet. Okay, so the problem with detail. the say again. I also haven't read it in detail because I was just looking at the issue for the first so time. The like, problem with the, the current API is um, what gets rooted and what doesn't. So if you say new timer, you give it a delegate, you give it the state, and you give it a due timing period, um, does your timer get kept alive or not? Like, let's say you set it to fire in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, will it actually fire if you drop all references to it or not? Um, and the answer is it kind of depends. Um, the implementation doesn't keep a reference to, oh, so let me take a step back. If you use the constructor that just takes a delegate, it doesn't take the state or the due time and the period, and then you subsequently use dot change to set the due time or the period, then the implementation will keep it alive. It, it will be rooted. Um, if you use the constructor that takes delegate, state, due time, and period, then the timer itself isn't going to be rooted by the implementation, but the delegate and the state are. And so if the delegate and the state then themselves reference the timer, then the timer will be kept alive as well, which makes it all very confusing. Um, so you end up with bugs where, for example, you store the timer as a field onto some instance, and you pass that instance in as your state, well, now your timer is rooted and it will never be cleaned up. So if you had some you know, infinitely repeating timer uh, and you uh, had expected that when you dropped your object, the timer would also get dropped and would stop firing, well, you're sorely mistaken. Your timer will keep firing and your object will stay alive forever because the timer is keeping it alive and it's keeping the timer alive. So the proposal here is let's make it very clear in uh, wait, this is the other proposal, right? We're looking at three. Oh, wait, no. Uh, oh, no, this is right. Yeah, this is it. Um, so my proposal is basically make it very clear in the API what routing behavior uh, you want. So, you know, from the name, you get either unsafe or not unsafe. And then from the argument um, that you pass, you get to choose what routing behavior you want. Um, my suggestion was for consistency, we basically have three modes, one of which is exactly the behavior that you have today, and that would, for better or worse, be the default um, so that it matches the, the corresponding constructor. But then you could explicitly say whether you want it to be rooted or unrooted. If you want it to be rooted, regardless of what your delegate and state do, the implementation ensures the timer remains scheduled until you explicitly, until either, you know, it's if it's a, a single fire timer until it fires or if it's periodic until you explicitly dispose it or change it to, to not fire. Uh, and if it's um, unrooted, no matter what you have in your delegate or state, once you drop references to the timer, the implementation won't keep it alive. So let me try to repro this in my head. So basically what you're saying is that like, the callback and the state is always going to be rooted, but the timer itself might not be. Is that correct? That's the case today, yes. 
And so then whether the timer object, so if, if you pass your callback just something that like does console.writeline and you pass null as state, then if you drop the reference to your timer, uh, when the GC runs, the timer will be collected and it'll never fire. Um, but if you passed as your object state something that referenced the timer, then it will fire. But like, I and don't understand time, why, we are, we, why do we have specific APIs for it, given this is how the world works? Like, this is not this issue specific to timer, correct? Well, no. it kind of is. It's kind of how we, what, what do you mean this is how the world works? Meaning, like, if you, uh, if you don't have roots, GC will collect them. If you yeah, but pass a callback or a state that has a, a reference to the uh, to the root, it will not be collected. Like, how? But, but you're you're saying that you assume that the timer is keeping a root to both the delegate and the state, and that it's obvious then that the, your state references your timer that it'll be kept alive forever. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, okay. In this particular case, that's the case. I'm saying the the larger issue is there are so many similar lifetime issues in our, like in when you code with C-sharp, why would we single out this one and tell um, So what, what we did in ASP.NET full framework back when I was on that um, is we had an API which was timer-like but wasn't actually timer. And what you did was you, you basically, you basically had a, a subscription for a periodic event to fire. So what you would do is you would give us your delegate, you would give us the duration, or the period rather, and then we would return to you a subscription handle. Until you actually called unsubscribe on the subscription handle, your delegate would be called back of every so often the period that you specified. We would also, for convenience, pass the subscription handle into your delegate as a parameter. But otherwise, you didn't have to keep track of anything. Like there was no that's, GC stuff. That's the, that's the rooted behavior here. Yeah. So the timer here that's returned is your subscription handle. Yeah. And that honestly is the intuitive behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's, and that's not the default behavior. Exactly. Yeah. Like it is a bit weird that, I mean, I think the problem is in practice is that people, the way they think about timers is that there is a global implicit instance that, just, that you're basically adding the callback to, right? You're subscribing yeah. to a global event, but that's not how the system works. So if you don't literally hold on to the timer yeah. yourself, your handler will never be called. That's not intuitive. Well, it may or may not be, to pay it's based on whether your right. delegate or state referenced yeah. it. Uh, like, 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 take the example that, that, that Diva just said, right? Mm -hmm. It would be very unintuitive if I have to store the, 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 uh, the, subs the subscription handle for my event make a GC. That's just non-intuitive behavior. Yeah. If, if I call subscribe to an event, then I expect it. Um... Was the API static? Yes. Well, and the ASP.NET runtime. Do we agree that out. this problem doesn't exist when you knew up a timer? So we have this it's other awesome. timer, the system timers. Mm -hmm. you, you knew it up, you add, it, add an event callback. Uh, is anybody surprised that the events won't fire when they lose the roots to the instance that they so, just yes. lose up? I, I, think I, there, I think there are a lot of people that are surprised by that, Christoph. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's even more surprising yeah. that we've got like three or four different timer classes that all operate differently. I agree with that. Yeah. So that uh, I agree with that, but that's just, I'm just saying. It, it's like timer's impossible to yeah. reason about because we've got four different implementations for different purposes that all behave differently. And don't necessarily follow the path of least surprise. System threading timer well, is the one true timer. Fight me. The answer is you you ignore all of them except for system threading timer. <laughs> so the other question I have, Stephen, is said so. Imagine we would not have the the optional argument at the at the at the end, and we would just say because these are net new methods, and we say the the static create and the static unsaved create behave in the fashion we just described, which is the timer gets implicitly rooted until you call dispose yep. on the output. Yeah. Would we ever want to have the, the other two? Like, is it actually the behavior that everybody that anybody ever wanted? Well, yeah, if you scroll up, uh, those two issues linked at the top want the unrooted behavior. We, we, just, we fixed bugs because we were getting rooted and we didn't want to.
Well, I think a bug money here this time as a hard. Steve, just just for fun, if you had a timer slim, just like how we have things like uh, weight, what is it, manual reset event slim, stuff like that, like would it actually make timers more intuitive for people and be lighter weight as far as resource usage? Uh, I don't think it'd be particularly lighter weight. Okay. There's pretty there's very little state that's stored for a timer in general. I don't think you could really store less. Okay. Um, I mean, basically, it stores for every timer. It stores the uh, you know the delegate, the state, and the execution context, the due time, and the period. That's basically it. The only thing that we there is one piece of state that we can avoid here um, that's relevant and that we would also avoid in the re, in the rooted case, and that is to implement the behavior where if you drop the references to the timer. Um, to implement the existing behavior where when you drop the reference to the timer, it gets collected. When you allocate a timer, it allocates a finalizable object. Yeah. Um, that finalizable object is what the timer references, and then the underlying implementation effectively, well, there's actually three objects. There's the timer, there's the timer holder, which is the finalizable object, and there's the thing that actually gets stored by the implementation. Um, the thing that gets stored by the implementation doesn't reference anything. The timer references the timer holder. The timer holder references the thing in the implementation. So basically, uh, if you drop the reference to the timer, then the reference to the finalizable object goes away. It can get collected. And when it's collected, that then basically tells the implementation to remove the reference it has to that physical object. Um, with, I, you know, with an approach where you say, I only care about this thing being rooted, um, effectively, you can get rid of that finalizable object. Because I, I recall, I think it was you, doing a lot of work in .NET 4 or 5 in order to slim this down as much as possible. So. Yeah, I mean, I've done more since, okay. but it's there's not really, other than that finalizable object, I'm not sure there's significantly more that could be done. I think once, if you had an API that says, I'm creating this thing as rooted, that's a about as good as you could do, um, and I don't think that a timer slim would allow you to do significantly better than that. Okay. So why a static create method rather than just adding the parameter at the end of the constructor? Who would call it? Uh, two reasons. Um, one, I think the existing constructors are confusing already since depending on which constructor you use, you get different behaviors. So I kind of wanted to go away from that. Second is our general approach for not flowing execution context is you prefix, prefix something with the unsafe keyword. Um, that means this necessarily can't be a constructor for the unsafe version of it, for the non-flowing version. And since we would then have an unsafe create that was static, it seems to make sense to have a create that was static. So they both kind of show up timer dot and you have your options. So what's the difference was, between think, create and unsafe create? Create captures and flows execution context. Unsafe create does not capture nor flow execution context. Okay. That, that terminology is pretty consistent throughout the framework all okay. Yeah, I think that, so that I would argue that I, I'm, I don't mind so much that unsafe create, you have to go to extra hoops to see the APIs, and in that sense, I'm not too sad about that. It doesn't flow well with constructors because we don't expect many people having to use it, I think. Um, but I think the argument with the constructors being confusing, I buy much more. Because there already is a hotspot. I think there's like five overloads in the constructor or something like this when I looked at this earlier. Like, it's not, it's not great. Oh, so why the heck did we call it unsafe? Well, this that, is such a missed opportunity. And Un keep unsafe on threading API specifically has the connotation that doesn't flow execution context. Yeah, I know. That was a mistake. Right, but at least you're consistent with that mistake. I know. I mean, the, the, the original reasons, as I understand it, Christoph, is execution context on desktop contains a whole bunch of stuff, including in your, who you're impersonating, you know, your Windows identity, uh, your CAS permissions, all that kind of stuff. So not flowing execution context was actually an unsafe operation with regards to, you know, you could escape um, the sandbox. Uh, you could escape the sandbox, um, which is also why anything that was unsafe was security critical. Yeah, so I so it's, honestly... Yeah, it's a largely, 
for the most part, it's a largely legacy term, although you could make us an argument that, you know, there's stuff that's sort of in um, an execution context now that does have related connotations. So, you know, ASP.NET puts its HTTP context into the um, into execution context uh, as an, you know, into an async local. And if you use one of these APIs, you know, if you use thread pool unsafe queues or work items instead of queues or work item, you're going to be running code not in the context of your original HTTP context. Um, uh, Windows Identity and .NET Core puts the impersonation information into the async local. So similarly, if you use you know unsafe queues or work item instead of queues or work item, and you're currently impersonating a user, um, the queued work item will or will not execute under that context under that impersonation de depending on which API you use. Well, but I agree. That, that, one, is, that the, one is very safe. You just don't have, you're not impersonated. So, well, it, uh, what's unsafe? I agree with the cars. Cars is kind of, um, I understand. If we yeah. if we introduce this naming convention during cars days, then I understand. Yeah. So, let's talk about this API then. So, the, yeah. The, so, to be, to be, both of these, you can do any of these with the existing APIs. It's just not intuitive. Right. Um, and if we if we make it intuitive, we can also save some cost in the rooted case. Um, the unrooted case is going to be more expensive no matter what we do. Uh, it's it, it's just harder to do uh, cheaply. No, I mean I'm fine. I mean you could imagine if you have an analyzer at some point that says don't use the constructor called this method and specify the behavior you want, right? I mean like that it seems like a reasonable uh, coding guideline too. So uh, one question about the name. Um, Let me drop the, the first name. The first value is called rooted state. Yeah, I couldn't come up with anything better. I'm <laughs> open to suggestions if we want to go this route. Fucked up. Legacy. Legacy. This is not what you want. Yeah. Well, if if it's not what you want, then wouldn't we make rooted the default, just to not surprise people? Yeah, I went back and forth on that. On the one hand, yes. On the other hand, then it further disagrees with what the corresponding constructor does. But maybe if it's a method and not a constructor, maybe that's enough argument to say. Who cares? Or maybe we don't even have, you know, maybe we don't even have that option. Yeah, at I, which point I, we could even. That's what I was thinking. Can we just remove the first value? Like, you the you either root or you don't root. Those are the new APIs. They are both static create methods. If you want. At which point you could also remove the enum and use a bool. I know we have you know maybe, concerns yeah. around bools, but yeah. that would mean that you wouldn't have you wouldn't. Have the unsafe create method for the uh, this is not what you want state, but maybe that's okay. Yeah, because it's basically it's, the behavior is strange, correct? Like you root the things that you don't need, and the timer is not rooted. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you said that we, Steve, we still want to give the ability for uh, callers to let the GC reclaim the timer and thus kill the period. Is that sorry? Say that again, Levi. You 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 still want the ability for people to use this API and have the the legacy like the you are now fully responsible for rooting the timer yourself, and if the GC reclaims it, you're unscheduled. Like you you still want that to be a potential behavior of this API, optional. That well, let me put it this way: that is a behavior that is needed in some cases. We could say that you're on your own. Uh, but I actually I don't know how you would even do that because if, if the implementation is free to root the timer object itself, yeah. then okay. My, my answer to your question is yes. We need that behavior. <laughs> okay. Any other option is like this, right? This is name of the ones that you kept alive. But it's just so one thing is naming. Second thing, this first value is. Almost always there. I cannot imagine when I would want to use the first value. I can't either. It's just the wrong thing to do. Yeah, in which case you could literally just get away with this, right? You could just say. Or have a bull if we don't 
think we'll ever add anything else. Yeah, actually, that's another bad idea. A Boolean that's just use legacy rooting behavior true false. No, 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 no. Or, no, no. Rooted tr equals true. Defaulted to true. Yeah, I think we yeah. have to re default to true because it's okay. super surprising. If you, if basically default is false, somebody calls this API, yeah. they, they would be super surprised. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm. Um, it, it's just no, normally we say we try defaulting to false yeah. and then like I know, I know. the boolean, but if. If, then if we could call it unrooted. We should call yeah. it unrooted and default is false. But if, if it if it causes us to us to jump through hoops to make this work, right? Just default it. Whatever. What's the what's the reason for the default uh, wanting a default to false for an argument like this? I, I don't care either way. I'm just curious. It's just so you. It's a convention. Uh, if you see a default parameter, yeah, you kind of don't have to read the docs, and you know that the the default value of the type of the parameter is the default. Yeah. And not that it matters, it's also cheaper to zero out memory than it is to set it to one. True. Yeah, <laughs> that seems like <laughs> a super micro I don't think we're, we're caring about <laughs> individual instructions. Sure, let's count the bits, but then let's allocate. All right, so then let me just scroll down here and say this is what we currently have. Is this a fair summary? Yeah. Yeah, that looks right. So do we want to default the period? I was thinking the same thing. Like, what do you actually have a period, or is it usually zero? A right. period, so it depends. If you, you're, there, you're basically, there are two primary use cases. Uh, there are other cases, but the two primary ones are you have a, a positive due time and a negative one for period, meaning there is no period, it's single fire. And the other is due time and period are the same because you want it to fire, you know, 10 seconds from now and then every 10 seconds after that. Um, you, there are cases, but they're rare, where you have a due time and a period differ, which just means I want this to fire the first time in X seconds and then I want it to fire every Y seconds after that. I mean, fine. I'm fine with having a period default to negative one. Although I don't know what that means. In we we couldn't default period to zero. We also can't default it here because yeah. it's a struct. Yeah, you, you right. would have to default to zero. Okay, let's leave it undefaulted. Yeah, that's why we generally have like the uint overloads and stuff. Yeah, make them make them specify times when it's fine. And that raises the question, do we want the inter, excuse me, inter U into overloads, but I'm fine with just time span. Yeah, I agree. So what was the last part? We should make them no, I think we said we're fine with just using time span. We don't need the integer overloads as well. Yeah, I see. So it's basically exactly as it is currently. Okay. Yeah, the end overloads are. No. All right. So then that's what we have. Then we can move this guy to approved. You know, we're going to mark the other one as, as closed. Which is it's down a little bit, yeah. This one. And then I think we should actually consider to go along with this. Again, like a Roslyn analyzer or something, just steering people toward the new one yeah. instead of using the constructors. Well, we, we have like a core effect analyzer thing in the Roslyn analyzer's repo, but no one ever adds anything to it. We have one? We have one. <laughs> that, the fact that that sentence ended with a question mark on my part might be why no one ever has anything yeah, yes, to it. Yes, we actually have a dedicated, like, this, this is the analyzers for the core FX repo APIs. Yeah. No one ever adds anything to it. So no are you saying you ship a, a package with a DLL that is literally empty? No, it, it, it contains a couple in there, <laughs> but no one ever adds new ones to it. Well, what is in there? I'll find out. And it's is, only is reference when you reference Rosalind? 
No, no, it's the Roslyn Analyzers repo, which contains like all the analyzers for Roslyn oh, and, and okay. FX Cop and the Core FX as well. But it's not referenced by default, right? You actually have to go to it. Right, you have, you have to explicitly oh, reference cool. it, but no one remembers that the project exists, so no one ever adds anything to it. Yeah. Well, they're too busy. So I'm lost right now. So. Yeah, Microsoft uh, NetCore Analyzers and Microsoft Net Framework Analyzers. So while we have Christoph and Stephen both here, <laughs> how about we close on the IAC discussion? Or the IAC innumerable discussion. So based on the last API review we did, my understanding, and that might be wrong, was that we did not really close on the semantics of the, you know, there was this discussion of whether we would get away with just having an IAC enumerator and not ever having an IAC innumerable, right? And there's some discussion in the community. I don't know whether you saw the blog post, Stephen, but this one guy from RX who blocked, I don't know, 12 pages worth of content about IAsync and Mobile and how this flies and you know, with the current like with the current copies that they have in RX, and they raised a similar concern about that the IAsync and Mobile effectively is the one that has to store the cancellation token now, which does not really work well for for sources that you want to query multiple times, right? Now. I don't think that the proposal that we had, which was the IAsync enumerate Tor, is the only API really solves that because you now only have basically a type that, by definition, you can only use once. Um, however, it seems to communicate the intent better, and it seems also that when we talked with Matt after the last meeting ended, is that there really isn't much of a use case for IAsync enumerable to begin with. It's just more or less a type that we have because it's the symmetric version of I enumerable. Asynchrony, uh, asynchronified, or whatever you want to call this. So well, let me let me interrupt you. Your goal here is to close on getting rid of enumerable. That's not going to happen in this meeting. No, my my goal is more or less to just close on the where are we with this issue? Because it seems like based on the notes where I said we should have another conversation around this, you said your understanding was that, uh, well, we may not have 100% agreement, but that's the design we have, and that's the design we are going with. And my, my takeaway was that we want to have another design meeting on what to do with the IASing enumerator issue and uh, the cancellation token. So I know I, I'm kind of with Steve. I think that it's such a large discussion. We, we need more people in the room. And no, no, I'm not there. saying to close on the issue. I'm closing on the, like, where are we with the notes? Do we need another design meeting on this or not? So here's here's yeah yeah I mean so here's where we are the without adding new language features the API design that we have now is the best we're going to get plain and simple so right now there are no plans to add such language features. And therefore, we have no option other than the API that we discussed. There's just simply nothing better. If the goal is to say we don't like that API, we need to raise the idea of new language features, that's a discussion to be had with C Sharp language team. For what it's worth, all the discussions that we had, uh, like all the concerns raised, and bandied about in that meeting, we've discussed over and over for the last five years, basically. There was nothing new there. Um, and it always comes down to, are you okay or not with storing something like the cancellation token in the enumerable? Um, and if you're okay with that and you see that you know, the majority use case is fine with it, and the other use cases, you can, there are workarounds, then the design works great. Uh, for the minority case where uh, you do need to reuse the same enumerable over and over and you're not okay with the workarounds, well, then you don't like the approach. Um, but that's not solved unless there are additional language features. Okay, it seems like there, okay, let me just start an email thread, like summarize, like basically what you just said, and then say, okay, where are we with this? Are we okay with just basically approving the current design as it is, or do we think we need to have a deeper discussion, in which case, uh, I think enumerable probably wouldn't happen in the 3.0 time frame, given that we would have to find additional language work that 
isn't even designed yet, right? I think that's probably also fair, right? Like if we if we have to do some substantial changes, probably the follow-up will be that IS renewable wouldn't happen for three years. So do we think, think that this language statement. feature is substantial design? Sorry, what? This language feature you believe is substantial design? All language features yes. are substantial design. <laughs> well, not all of them. Some no, of them are. No. It is. I mean, this is the whole getting. How do you access uh, the cancellation token that was passed to the get enumerator method from inside of an async method? Well, I think Crystal's argument would be you get away with just language feature that would just be make an iterator itself. Uh, sorry, make an enumerator itself being enumerable, right? And I mean. I think that's an area that is also not entirely <laughs> agreed upon, but that would be one. But that, no, no, that no. doesn't address the 12-page blog post you referred to. Y yes, Steve oh, is right. Fair enough, fair Basically, enough, fair enough. that would mean it would work. Don't get me wrong. It would work, but it means you cannot implement these things using you. So there are two sides of this language feature. One is the for each, which I, agree, I would argue is super easy. And then there is this yield one, which is very hard. Yeah. No, but, but yield you can do with a numerator itself. <laughs> Um, if you have a method that's it's declared as returning an enumerator, you can use yield already. No, no, but, but you can't reuse it, Emo. It doesn't address the the, the whole concern was around these things that are reusable, and that's not reusable. That is not reusable. That's true, but I mean that was, I thought that was the point. But I think okay, fair enough. No, but if if, if the concern if the concern is reusability, then you can't return an enumerator. If the concern is not reusability, then what we have is fine. Yeah, I think the concern was more like. We believe that's the best we can do, but the, but the, but the APIs don't describe what ends up happening. But I might be wrong, but I mean that was my my summary from what I had when we talked with Mats last time. But in any case, like things like that seems to be we need to have an email with everybody on on the on the two line, and then like we either give it one way, we have another meeting, or we don't. All right. So then I think we are twenty minutes left, where we can maybe book a few more APIs. Um, I think, yeah, this is the one we should probably approve because that is pretty close to being approvable, in my opinion. Yeah, this is the one that we discussed last time. I sent email. I don't think anybody responded to that. So let's do this here. So this is the API that we discussed with uh, a subset of this group here and the CodeGen guys about having capability API for reflection in mid, where the goal is to give you two APIs. One of them is basically telling you, do you have the ability to generate code on the fly, yes or no, aka does, you know, um, LCG and Refimit just blow up, or do they work? And then the second API tells you like how efficient the implementation of works is. Is, is, it, an, is it an interpreter, or is it actually uh, literally compiling the code down to machine code and executing So what it? if it's uh, initially interpreted and then compiled? We said that that's just uh, the same as eventually being compiled to machine code. Yeah. So yeah. basically, the second property says, um, so is it is there a possibility of compilation happening? Is that what it is? Well, it's more like for for this scenario, right? So the first scenario is you want to fail eagerly, so you only care about supported. So instead of failing deep down in the bowels of your implementation, you can check only whether you can refinement to begin yeah, with. Yeah. And the second one tells you the quality. So the idea is that I want to use refinement for perf optimization, so I care that the code is compiled. So first run doesn't matter as much as according to Jan. Jan just says, well, if it's tiered, then it's fine. Eventually, you get good perf, so you should use it. So I wonder whether the uh, second property name should not basically say is interpreted only. Because for example, I will probably in a month forget what the second one means, whether it's definitive or not. Yeah, we, but if it's called is interpreted only, then I will always know what it does, what it means. I think we the original one we, we had, and then when we actually wrote sample code, it ended up we always in accidentally flipped a bit. Yeah, but you know the semantics when you write the code. I'm saying. Sorry, I, I, I missed something. So, Christopher, are you you're suggesting we just invert the second property's meaning? Make it very clear whether it's, you know, because basically the semantics of the property is comp compilation will happen at some point. That's basically the property. Yeah, and it's not clear from the name because it's a uh, you know like I, I was saying. Well, initially it may just interpret for a while, and then then it is that covered by this you know property, and the answer is I see. yes, but it's not clear from the name. What about if you name it is dynamic code efficient or fast? Because I mean it's really it's it's really indicative of the quality that you get. Yeah, it's really what it is. Or something like that. Uh, but but then you're out. out 
to the interpretation of what does fast mean? Well, that's when you read the doc. I mean, like at some point, you just have to say like, there's only so much fidelity that the thing can do, yeah. and the more specific we get here, the the harder it gets for people to use it correctly. I, like I, the the only thing I don't want is I don't want to invert the meaning here because it gets it really hard to explain what it does, because you don't have to describe the return value in terms of this one here, and if this one is an what, inverted one of the first one, it gets. So what, what if you had yeah. is dynamic code supported and is dynamic code compilation supported? I don't know if that would really convey the meaning because you would still be able to use code gen and you would still be able to call methods that say compile this dynamic method. It would just be interpreted, right? Yeah. Yeah, because the real point is like, can I do dynamic code generation at all? And if I do, is it going to be fast? And so the, the second one is basically saying this is fast because at some point it may be compiled and cached. Maybe and it, it won't should, have to. Maybe it should be, is dynamic code supported? Should I be using it? That is literally what it is, but I come over and Like, that's the... <laughs> In what scenario would you want to use uh, dynamic code if the first property returned true and the second property returned false? Like, if you actually need to generate types on the fly. Like, proxies. I, I, I see. But... Uh, what if you need to, why not just do it? Because you don't want to blow up deep in the implementation, you want to give people an early heads up why things will not work, rather than fading with some spectacularly obscure error message. So it's a case of whether you have another option or not. Right. Yeah. And yeah, okay. I see. So the first one is if you have another option or not, and the second one is you have multiple options and you're trying to decide which to choose between. Yeah. yeah, like the second one is like you, you just use Cogen to speed things up, right? The the DI container and ASP.NET is a good example, regex or other things where it's just, well, I don't actually have to use it. I only want to ever use it if it's faster than interpreting it on my end. I mean, re really the second one is just, is there a jet, right? Basically, although, well, yeah. yeah. The problem is ASP.NET or like Mono will have a JIT by interpretation, right? So that's, you know, not really a It's issue. almost like if we, are we okay with the prefix being not is, but can? Can dynamic code be compiled? It basically also solves my problem. Because is, I'm like, well, initially it's not. In, well, uh, the problem with that is like similar to what Levi's argument is, like you call methods called compile. Yeah. Like, and it works. They will work, right? That's the point. It just doesn't have the performance you expect. Yeah. I mean, I honestly don't have a good answer for this beyond that. Like, really, what this is, this is, this is a, this is a, can I do it here? This is, is the quality of good enough. And I, I don't know how to convey that with names better than what we have here. But like, I, I like the idea that they have a common prefix because they tell you that they are related. That's why I really don't want to have them differently. And I also think that I want the second one to be just a stronger version of the first one. Like, that's why I don't want to have them inverted. So I can, I, I, I can live with them saying as this. Another but one suggestion. Would it help if we say, is dynamic code ever compiled? That, that doesn't work with the word. I mean, it's more semantically correct. <laughs> I'm, I'm still trying it's, uh, yeah, yeah. to figure yeah. out like the scenario where I would actually take a separate course of action if I discover that dynamic code is supported but it gets interpreted because the interpreter will probably still do the same thing that I would have done in my fallback case anyway. So would I really have changed what I do in the end? I thought that's what you must have if you need types. No, that's, is dynamic code supported will return false if you can't even recommend types. Well, yeah. Yeah, interpretation yeah, isn't, isn't always as fast as like a hard-coded software fallback. Like take regex, right? I, I, I mean, if you inter I'll interpret the regex. Yeah. It's probably slower than walking the DMA. I'm sure, okay. And so that that's kind of the case. It's like, can't if I want to do dynamic code gen because I have to, then I only want the first one. But if I want it to be fast because I'm doing something like regex and yeah. so you're implementing regex, you're not calling into regex. Is your scenario? Yeah, it's yeah. like I, I these are more for like I'm a framework author yeah. rather than I'm an app author. Yeah, these are not apps. I don't mean things. These are like I do some heavy lifting and I want to have some experience on my consumers. I mean, what about we call this dynamic code jitted? 
But so, you said yourself, like a JIT could be interpreted rather than compiled. But I know, but I, I think people, and t I think people expect the word jitted to mean I produce like x86 code down or yeah. whatever. Yeah, I, I think there's a clear distinction in the compiler world bef between in, I'm interpreting something yeah. and I'm compiling something. Yeah. yeah. It's just and, that is a, is a strange word. Like that's why I, I wrote compile division because it seems a bit. Cool. But it's what people care about, though. Right? Like they want to know if the JIT's going to kick in. Yeah, I mean, ever compiled is is it is it compiled just in time, right? I mean, is dynamic code code work? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So if if it didn't if you didn't have to say if you didn't have to have dynamic code as a prefix, right? You could say is just in time compilation enabled. Runtime feature, JIT supported. Yeah, basically. Yeah, that's what we had originally. It means that if you it's care about the dynamic code, like all of experience, you have to know to look at these two different fields, and one of them doesn't begin with the phrase dynamic code. But that's probably just something that can be docked or that you can just kind of glean from using the API after time. By the way, my care level about this is relatively small. But I yeah. have it's good to fun to raffle, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, if you feel strongly about these names, I, I'm totally we, fine. We spent like an hour and a half discussing yeah. them with people who are going to use the API. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the only one we like. So, like, right. I mean, I. Yeah. It's fine. Because it's also not just dynamic code. Can I pull in this arbitrary DLL right. and have it compile? Yeah. yeah. Right. That's static yeah. code. All right. Let's. So I think we have like we ignoring the name. It's generally fine with these APIs yeah, yeah. being in the compiler services. So yeah. we are cool with adding a type called runtime features. That is the, because these are, these are the more I think heavy lifting. I things. have one more uh, yes. question because what Levi just said. Uh -oh. Why? If I only want to check whether JIT is supported, do we have an API for it? I forget about. I'm not dealing with dynamic code. It's, it's that second one right there. Yeah, the second one. Well, that it's weird that it has this thing yeah. about dynamic code in it. Well, but but the question is, what is your scenario? Why do you want to know what you have, whether you have the JIT? I'm I'm so in ASP.NET like, we have a diagnostics page. Right. Like we we output a bunch of stuff about the runtime environment, about configuration stuff like that. Yes. It would be nice to be able to output this as like does your environment even allow JIT? Yeah. And I think dynamic code still makes sense because DLLs are dynamic libraries that you can dynamically pull into your statically linked code. So, to be <laughs> so is dynamic code supported with uh, return false if we cannot load DLL? No, if you wouldn't. Oh. Because he oh. now re uh, redefined the dynamic code as being DLL. <laughs> well, well, not necessarily. Like it contains, if it contains static assembly, like you can load it and go, right? Yeah, no, because no, but, but he redefined in the second method. Dynamic code meaning DLLs, uh, you basically DLL applies. I mean, well, if you had a text file and you read it in mm -hmm. memory, but it was really a DLL, you could execute the code by jumping to it. Yeah. So it it it, it it's still the same thing, you know. Okay, let's. Say I'm grant, uh, granting you it's the same thing. <laughs> so will the first property return true if you can load DLLs? It doesn't matter because if you dynamic code according to your definition. It is doesn't supporting. matter. Loading doesn't matter. It's the execution matters. Yeah. Well, loading also matters to a point, right? If you do an assembly load with a byte array, right, that will only work if you have a JIT. Okay, so is dynamic code supported? It will always use well, true no, because you can, you can always execute the DLLs. You can't always execute DLLs. Okay, so when like, you can execute I, the like DLLs, iOS. so when you can execute DLLs, the first one will return true. I think the first one is intended for things like dynamic method, where you're emitting IL right. directly and then you exactly. want to compile it. That's why I'm saying he, he was trying to redefine dynamic as meaning, you know, DLLs. Well, and I, I don't think that's. I was trying to say that it means that any arbitrary code that you load, <coughs> whether you're loading it from an external file, dynamically yeah. writing it to a byte array, etc., it means that you can execute it. Does, does the, the, the first means yeah. that it might be interpreted, and the second one means that it will definitely be yeah. compiled down to machine code at some point, potentially. Yeah, so I, I think the, the meta point that Tanner's making is like, does does the first, if the first method really applies to things like dynamic method, like is that, it, is that explicit from the, from the name of the property? Yeah, yeah it's not. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> it's also very overloaded, dynamic code. It is. It's it's basically, you can it. It. Yeah, but we're we're talking in the context here. We're talking about things like dynamic method and types and stuff like that. Yeah, it's like assembly dot load. Yeah. Like, how do you unify all of those names? Assembly dot load, ref init, LCG. Create a byte array. Call function pointer dot get delegate. Hey, where's the list? I think there's a list somewhere here. Yeah, the, here's all the things that, that are impacted by this. Yeah. Like, honestly, the dynamic code is the closest one we've come up with that was not completely weird. Like, I'm not married to these names, but I also feel like, I don't know, like yeah. all the other proposals are yeah. worse that's in other ways. Time. Yeah, that's fine. And the cool. type is fine. The type doesn't, I mean, the type already exists. That's the one we use for. We'll just the study discovery of runtime features, yeah. which is somewhat weird. So there's like uh, existing, let me show you what the type looks like currently. I think we only have two fields on it. I mean, uh, this is all a, a documentation exercise anyway, right? Like we're, we're going to have to probably have to read them, yeah. It's these, guys, it's these guys here, right? So they have this supported flag. They have these two fields, which means that they are there. The runtime has support for it. And so when you pass in the strings for those, it would also return true or false, depending on what these things do. Oh, what are the strings for those? Uh, the, the name, name of the property. Yeah. Name of this guy. Like could mention, but it's the it's this part here. Yeah. All right, then you consider this done for three O and then we can finally start working on the code for that. So I think we have five minutes left. Maybe there's one more we can improve. I've got a short one, which is uh, two six five eight two. It's just adding two APIs to system numerics complex. Sorry, two six five eight two. Two six five eight two. Two six five oh, sorry. eight two. Yeah, sorry, it's the wrong uh, issues. That is not two six five eight. What the hell? <laughs> oh, okay. Three two <laughs> two two five. My URL bar was messed up. Three two two five. two five. Two two five. There's one more two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we added APIs to double and single already. Um, complex has similar properties, uh, but we don't expose the. Uh, capability to check, is it finite, is it non number, is it infinity? And so they want to add these APIs as well. Um, for not a number and infinity, the static values we would return would be uh, both fields set to not a number for not a number and both fields set to positive infinity for infinity. Um, not a number does not make a distinction between, or complex does not make a distinction between positive and negative infinity like regular. Um, single and double does. So where did we add these guys to before? Uh, we already have similar APIs on single and double. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. And they named the same, I suppose. Right. Oops. oops. That was. Yeah, this is easy. That was impressive. Saying something will take five minutes and it took less. <laughs> <laughs> And it was a complex API. Thanks. Um, all right. We're on a roll, Tanner. What else you got? I've got one that won't take five minutes. It's adding, <laughs> it's making int pointer and uint pointer match, which is. <laughs> oh yes. Because we've got APIs we exposed on int pointer that we did not expose on uint pointer. <laughs> yeah, let's maybe not. Uh, and then there's the other one, which is exposed Let's to operators. Let's go to lunch. I think nothing <laughs> here is taking three minutes. I need to go to lunch because I have a meeting at one. All right. Thanks, guys, online. Thank you. Uh, let me stop streaming. Anybody wants to go to cafeteria here quickly? Sure. <laughs>